Well, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's just uh, very much appreciated by me and uh, and uh, our readers. I'm glad that. Uh... Oh. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here, especially uh, via Rupert, who's become a sort of friend in the last couple of years. Yeah, it's just the uh, the first the first time I, I heard about you was in in the conversation with him in this festival. Uh -huh. it was a fascinating conversation, and I watched. And thank you very much for the papers. I read them through and uh, found it very, kind of broadened my horizon on that topic. <laughs> Wow, I'm surprised you read them already. That was quick. That was good. Yes, yes, I did. Made uh, made notes and uh, and um, well, um, as I as I explained to you, we work through a rather exoteric medium, the newspaper, a, sup a monthly supplement of the largest daily paper, which is, um, I mean, yeah. that gives you the idea of the audience. Right. Yeah, um, wonderful. A uh, uh, majority of them probably will dispose a supplement like right away. <laughs> A few thousand uh, would read them, I think. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Wonderful. So that gives you the idea of the audience and the, the kind of level of discussion, I, th I think. that. Uh... So okay. why wouldn't we start with uh, just, um, you work at the intersection of psychedelics and philosophy. I mean, in this part of the woods, this comes as a rather kind of, let's say, un unorthodox combination. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, story, of my, story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> how did you How did you find that subject? Then let's go. Let's see how we go. From, yeah. Where we go from there? Well, many years ago, I was teaching in a college in London, and um, I um, I was in my twenties, and I was I was roped in to teach philosophy of religion, and it wasn't really an interest of mine. I was always interested really in philosophy of mind, consciousness generally. Mm -hmm. Philosophy of religion, I considered part of theology, and at the time, I was kind of you know. As many twenty-year-old males in England are sort of materialist atheist, blah blah. Anyway, so I said, yeah, sure, I'll, 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 I'll have a go at teaching it, and um, and that got me hooked onto William James, who was part of the uh, syllabus, and especially his varieties of religious experience, nineteen o two, which I, which you know, of course, and um, you know, in the in, in the last chapters, lectures of that um book, there, there's um, there are words on mysticism, and um, you know, I was. I was sort of teaching this, but he talked about these mystical states, which I had never personally um, experienced. And then, of course, he he also um, brought, fused them together with uh, drug-induced states, which I realized later on was actually um, influenced by another philosopher, a sort of um, amateur philosopher called Benjamin Paul Blood, in relation to nitrous oxide. Anyway, um, so so William James wrote about these experiential states and and you know, one of the um, criteria, um, cr one of the criteria were was um, that they were noetic. In other words, when you were in them, you felt like this what you were perceiving was real, mm -hmm. um, objectively real, not just a hallucination. And um, anyway, so this kind of intrigued me, especially because I was interested in the consciousness and philosophy of mind. And um, <clears throat> you know, I just wished I had uh, you know experiential um, uh, knowledge of this. You know, knowledge by acquaintance, and um, but then as it happens, hello. Being <laughs> late. <laughs> no, it's all right. You know, it's a academisches Verte. You know that German word. It means you got fifteen minutes leeway. <laughs> so we just in the first question, how we how Peter got into that uh, intersection of uh, psychedelics and philosophy. Yes, yeah, so I was just saying, I, I was teaching philosophy of religion in a college in London, and that involved William James's book, Varieties of Religious Experience, and then interested me as a philosopher of mind in, um, you know, mystical experience, mental experience. And then as that happens, my my younger brother was um is a sort of an amateur mycologist, mushroom expert, and, and we went for a walk in Cornwall where I was brought up. I was born in Sweden, but I was raised in Cornwall, which yeah. is southwest in Britain, and um. And he said, Peter, I think these are magic mushrooms down here. And I said, Oh, really? Interesting. They <laughs> say, so, so, so I picked, I picked about seventy, I think, quite a lot, and um, oh. I never found so, that many again, and um, in one place. And then, and then I took them home, and I sort of, you know, checked that they were not poisonous or whatever. And then I took them to London, where I was living, teaching. And then I took a small dose just to, to see, you know, if they didn't kill me or whatever. And, uh, it was quite interesting, you know, mild, mild experience. And then I took a big a week later, I took a big dose and I had this most overwhelming uh, experience. I won't go into I've, I've spoken about it so many times, I can tell you about it, but the phenomenology was sort of um, beyond the imagination, beyond dreams. Uh, the intensity of emotion was extreme, et cetera, et cetera. And um, 
and there were states that you can't the you know there did not exist words for so not um qualia not not emotions not visions not hearings or anything like that just completely alien forms of mentality mm. anyway so that suddenly then really inspired me as a philosopher of mind i thought geez I, I need to learn more about this you know so i went into the literature or I, what i thought was the literature and discovered there was not much about it interestingly in philosophy you know um th there's a lot since William James's book, there's quite a lot in psychology, but this is mostly data driven in the 20th century um, as it evolved. But in philosophy, so, you know, especially philosophy of mind, which relates to the question of how mind relates to matter, you know, the hard problem of consciousness, um, there was really very little. I've discovered more as time went on. But anyway, as a result of that, I thought, okay, I'll, I need to sort of get people talking about this. And that's when I, I wrote my book in 2015, Numenautics, which, ex which details my experience. And then, um, and then a few a couple of other books after that and um and then uh, yeah and then i i didn't do my phd on it i did my phd in panpsychism the view that mind is ubiquitous in nature but after that um i i you know got a job with the university and 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 now we're pursuing uh philosophy of psychedelics quite quite in a in quite rigorous manner mm -hmm. When was when was what year was the uh, was the experience with the mushrooms? Oh God, um, let me think. It's about it was about two thousand and nine, two thousand eight, maybe. I can't quite remember. Yeah, about then. Yeah. Well, um, uh, there is a lot of talk about psychedelic renaissance uh, around now, and uh, and uh, in your paper you refer to uh, Andrew Andrew Baird, I guess it was the name who. Who talks about the who mm. talks about the metaphysical turn that the metaphysics is also uh, coming back after the uh, after the long reign of logical positivism and logical uh, also was it behavior yeah yeah uh, so could you please comment on 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 each of these like the meta uh, psychedelic renaissance and uh, metaphysical renaissance so to speak yeah. and the connections and is it about the zeitgeist or you know. <laughs> As well as a complicated a historical issue, but it's, it's quite interesting because when, um, you know, you know, I don't know, well, you know, LSD hit the Western culture in the sort of 1950s. It was well, it was developed in 1938 and taken in 1943 by Albert Hoffman in Switzerland. Then it was used in psycholytic therapy and psychedelic therapy in the US um, quite successfully. And then it sort of got out of hand with Timothy Leary and it became, you know, sensationalized in the media in the 1960s. And then, you know, in 1970, you've got the UN um, legislation against it, worldwide legislation against it, prohibition. Um, but the interesting thing is during that, that period, um, philosophy was in um, a kind of very reductive state. So you had the logical positivism, which sort of stemmed many ways from the Vienna Circle from Austria, but... Um, was taken to Britain by A.J. Eyre, especially inspired um, by Wittgenstein, who's teaching at Cambridge, and Gilbert Ryle at Oxford. And this, you know, pretty much they, I mean, A.J. Eyre wrote a, a paper in, in the early 30s called, you know, On the Impossibility of Metaphysics. And, um, and then the philosophy of language and logical positivism became popular. And consciousness was the sort of almost... Um, you know, it was believed to be an illusion, you know, in many ways, you had all these reductive theories like psychoneural identity theory, logical behaviorism, uh, and so on and so forth. And, um, and it was very unfortunate that that, that in philosophy, it co coincided with this interest in psychedelic consciousness. So a lot of the psychedelic um, intellectuals like Aldous Huxley and Alan Watts and people like that had to turn to the East to sort of make some kind of metaphysical sense of it, Zen especially, and also, you know, the Vedantas to a certain extent. Um, so that was interfused with Western culture then already, but Western metaphysics was seen to be dead. Um, but with this metaphysical turn you speak of, so um, logical positivism was very popular. It was also sort of in line with the scientific mode of uh, measurement, data-driven, you know, objective uh, forms of facts. Um, but it ran into a lot of paradoxes. For example, um, the verification principle at its basis couldn't be verified itself. Um, problem of other minds was, you know, the problem of uh, universal laws and stuff like that. It just didn't make sense. And eventually, A.J. Eyre even said, mm -hmm. you know, metaphysics is not a bad word anymore in the 1980s. And then just before he died, he had a metaphysical experience himself, uh, not under psychedelics, but under salmon. You know, he choked on salmon 
mm. in my body, you know, the new, whilst under new, having pneumonia and then had this sort of psychedelic like experience. After which he read an article saying that maybe death is not the end of consciousness. <laughs> After, or yeah, maybe yeah, maybe death is not the end of our consciousness. But he still didn't believe in God. But anyway, it's sort of representative of this metaphysical turn then that happened really in the late twentieth century. Um, and then since then, metaphysics has become um, um, a very popular um, discipline within philosophy. Once again, it's one of the three pillars of philosophy originally, of course, that ethics and epistemology as well. And um, but but it's mostly analytic metaphysics. So you look at one small segment of metaphysics, like what is causation, what is identity over time, uh, what is a modality, you know, as opposed to the systematic metaphysics of the past, where people like Spinoza, Schopenhauer, Leibniz, you know, who had whole systems where everything sort of cohered. Mm -hmm. So with this psychedelic renaissance now, which is mostly medical, it's interesting because we it now occurs in a metaphysical space, which is much more open. And it realizes the limitations of its criticism. So that's why I think there are a lot, there's a lot more sort of interest in it now in, in that metaphysical sense. Yeah, it's, I see the photo of Ber Bergson behind you, <laughs> that's right, yeah. behind your back. And uh, <laughs> and I didn't know, actually, I thought it was Hoffman who first hypothesized that uh, Plato uh, had his, uh, that the roots of uh, Plato's philosophy are in, uh, are in <laughs> Illusion Mysteries. But I didn't realize. I, I didn't. Uh, that's the first time I read about it. Ber Bergson was the first who who yeah. heard that. Could you just please comment on that? Uh, uh, let's 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 start from from uh, from the very beginning. Then Plato's uh, uh, right. uh, Plato's psychedelics experiences. <laughs> well, Bergson's last book, this one, Morality and uh, on the two sources of morality and religion. Um, that's where he proposes that Plato. Well, he, he proposes that there were mystery religions like Orphism, um, the Dionysian festivals, the especially the Eleusinian festivals, and he spoke of Plato and um, all the philosophers really going there. I mean, everyone did attend these rituals, um, which happened for two thousand years every year, you know. And even I mean, everyone was almost everyone was allowed to attend them. And um, he Bergson speculates in that book. I can't remember the year exactly, but it's uh, early twentieth, if not late 19th century um that um the experiences that plato gained within the mysteries um influenced his philosophy and when you read when you read uh, plato's phaedrus his phaedo and a number of other um books you sort of um you get hints at these psychedelic experiences especially in the phaedrus when he's going along the train of zeus or something like that but of course it was forbidden to speak about the, the mysteries in ancient greece it was a uh, severely punishable so it's never made explicit. Um, so that was his conjecture. But the next conjecture, which um, the, the sort of the move that Hoffman made in, in the road to Eleusis with uh, Ruck and Wasson and others was that the um, cause of that mystical experience was um, a psychedelic drug. And they speculated that it was ergot, mm -hmm. which is the base, basis of um, LSD. And there's a lot, there's no archaeological evidence for that, except just they're just suggestions. So, you know, there's suggestions that people had life changing experiences, lost the fear of death. It was a very popular religious movement. Um, it's lasted longer than Christianity has lasted already, you know, closed down by the Christians in the fifth century, fourth century. But then um, there is a theory from, from uh, yeah, Hoffman, Ruck, and all that, that um, it was a got, but there was no archaeological proof. But interestingly, uh, new new evidence has come to light in the last few years, last last years, where um, they've discovered that there was a another in ancient Spain, there was um, a, a sacred ritual site um, called um, Castellar, where they found um, um, a ritual devoted to Demeter and Persephone, which were the two goddesses that the Eleusinian mystery focused on. And they found a little cup in it with a residue of ergot. Mm. That was two hundred. So that okay, it's not it's not Greece, but um, it means that at the time, two hundred BC and around, well, in the ancient times, uh, they were using ergot. You know, at least there. So it seems likely, more likely than its opposite, that there was some kind of psychedelic or psychoactive drugs being used in ancient Greece. Plus the fact that ancient Greek wine was psychoactive, you know, it was a very strong uh, uh, drink, you know, that had to be watered down all the time. There's a book about it by Michael Ranella at Pharmacon, you know, 
that details it. So anyway, the other point here is that um, Bergson's speculation is that, um, yeah, the sort of, you know, the very basis of philosophy in terms of Plato's philosophy, at least, you know, in terms of transcendental forms and uh, mind-body dualism was based on these um, mystical experiences, which might have been, probably were, at least in many cases, induced by psychedelic drugs. Mm -hmm. um, right, closer to the closer to the subject that uh, you make, again, I... Uh, uh, my background in this field is is, is ra rather modest. So, uh, but I found uh, what I found interesting that you divide uh, metaphysics into two uh, categories: intellectual metaphysics and experiential metaphysics. And uh, yeah. would you please uh, just uh, okay uh, uh, add something uh, to the experiential side, especially which okay. is as closer to the to the subject at hand, anyway. So metaphysics um, is generally known as generally intellect, what I call intellectual metaphysics. So it's a study, use reason, your intelligence to understand, um, um, you know, and the basis of reality. That's what metaphysics is really about, being qua being. Aristotle says it's named after Aristotle's book, The Metaphysics, which means literally after physics, after his books, The Physics. Um, and, you know, this has been studied then since ancient times and... Um, became like a handmaid into theology in medieval times and then took a life of its own from the sort of 16th 17th centuries in the west um but uh <clears throat> but it's purely based on reason rather than um any kind of uh experiential insight except for that i i divide i yeah as you say i bifurcate intellectual metaphysics from experiential metaphysics so um a number of these metaphysical systems, such as, and a, a prime example would be like Spinoza's pantheism or monism. Um, it seems that many uh, states of altered consciousness can grasp these something akin to these intellectual metaphysical systems um, intuitively rather than rationally. And that's what I mean by experiential metaphysics. Uh, to give you an example, William James, in his book Varieties, said in the nitrous oxide trance, we get a true metaphysical revelation. So it's, it's, a, it's a perception of reality, which is not then necessarily a delusion, but it might contain elements of metaphysics, you know, of reality itself, and metaphysics is the study of reality. Another example I give in this paper I sent you, um, Deleuze, following Roman Roland, you know, the poet, poet he says, um, Spinozism can be understood through like a lot of uh, you know, years of research, really uh, reading, especially his book, The Ethics, which is sort of a very mathematical text in many ways. Um, but it can also be gained in a flash, you know, the flash of Spinozism, book by Roman Roland, and where you suddenly see is the sort of, um, you know, God is nature, mind is matter, all, all in one go, as it were. Of course, when you come out of that, you can't necessarily explain it, or you can't even make sense of it necessarily. But um, that's what I mean by experiential metaphysics, a sort of intuitive grasp of what reason can also grasp, but from a different angle. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I, uh, I understand that your work there is just to, to provide some kind of uh, theoretical metaphysical framework for the people who have experienced the uh, psychedelic, mystic, who are through psychedelics, uh, um, come to the uh, mystical experiences, and so that they, they have something to 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 rely on. Am I uh, am I correct in? Yeah, well, that's that's. I'm so you know, I'm about to. Well, this published this paper should be published soon in Frontiers in Psychology on the need for metaphysics and psychedelic therapy and research, which is exactly that. So many, you know. Okay, so since William James, nineteen o two, mysticism in academia has been taken over by psychology and um, and not philosophy. But it seems that the <clears throat> a, lot, a lot of empirical studies recently have shown that certain peak psychedelic states are very often involving some kind of monistic insight or pantheistic insight um, have the greatest therapeutic benefit. Mm -hmm. Why is people don't really know, but one main theory is that when you when someone who's suffering, let's say addiction or um, anxiety, when they see they intuit reality in a greater, much greater, grander scale, their own personal self becomes relatively less important, and thus their problems become less important. Mm -hmm. And thus they don't need to mask their problems with alcohol because they're suddenly relatively insignificant, you know, in a positive way. Anyway, um, 
so it seems that psychedelics can, not always, but can induce such experiences. Um, but but then what happens at the moment in psychedelic, it's called psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, is that you have this preparatory stage with psychologists or psychiatrists, you have the drug session itself, and you have an integrative phase at the end, trying to integrate the experience into your the significance of your life. But of course, um, the psychologists, therapists, psychiatrists have not generally, there are some exceptions, but generally have not been trained in metaphysics or philosophy. And so um, when someone talks about like a pantheistic insight, and there's very little <laughs> framework in which a psychologist can, can provide um, integration, I think. So I'm suggesting that, you know, as well as psychologists, you need um, some kind of, well, you can train psychologists in metaphysics to a certain extent, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in 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 an intelligible way, in which that participants can understand, you know. So you don't get into deep metaphysics, of course, but you have some kind of guide. Mm -hmm. The reason for the so so and it's ultimately a simple point, which is that if you're going to have a metaphysical experience, integration should have recourse to metaphysics. Very simple. And when I sp when I've spoken to many um, therapists doing psychedelic therapy and they all agree you know that this would be a, a useful optional additional tool it's not a replacement but something that they could draw upon if necessary if the participant wants it you know mm -hmm. and um so this is what i'm working on at the moment so i've created a metaphysical matrix to make it you know relatively simple and a questionnaire mm -hmm. and so on but i think i think that ultimately i think the ultimate point is this that you know, with William James at the start there, I mean, William James was a psychologist and a philosopher. And he himself, after the varieties of religious experience, like in the pluralistic, a, pl a pluralistic universe, his last book, collection of essays, um, he talks about integrating such religious experiences within um, the framework of metaphysics of Bergson, Fechner, and Hegel. But this was lost to history. People don't really ever think about this, don't consider this. But obviously, I think metaphysics has a large role to play in this now emerging field of psychedelic therapy, because it is ultimately metaphysical experience. I do make a distinction between mystical and metaphysical experience, so they do overlap, but there's some differences as well. You know, so for example, you can have very Christian mystical experiences, Saint John of the Cross, and so on, and um, and and uh, you can have psychedelic experiences which are not mystical or metaphysical, you know, just like laughing or becoming a better hunter or something like this. <laughs> and you can have metaphysical, the parts of metaphysics which have got nothing to do with mysticism and psychedelics, like, um, you know, the question as to what um, efficient causation is. You know? uh, so there's, a, there's an overlap. There's three circles that overlap. But in the middle is the important part for therapy, I think. And not just therapy, I should say, as well. I think over time, you know, social societal enrichment ultimately yeah. if people are very careful unlike they were in the 20th century right so what i mean what, what uh, is it, is it... a little aside from the main course of the uh, of the conversation but the, the backlash against uh psychedelics in in 70s how do you how do you what 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 were what were the main causes for that uh, and uh, yeah, well the, i think there are many causes so you can't really highlight one i think um i mean one historical legacy is when the um when america was discovered and the conquistadors they actually prohibited psychedelic drugs pretty immediately and they said they were like induced devil devil worship and so on um that can that legacy in Roman Catholicism continued, I believe. Protestants, of course, um, were generally prohibitive. You had in America, early 20th century, you know, alcohol prohibition. Um, and that thought didn't work out politically, but that thought remained, I think. Um, any any altering of states of consciousness was generally seen as something that was um, unnatural from a theological point of view. That's one reason. Um, another reason was uh, seems to be uh, quite racist. So Nixon wanted to get rid of um, certain demographics for voting. Those included black people and the hippies. So he got rid of crack cocaine and LSD. Or he, you know, that was part of the prohibition. Um, I think there are other genuine, genuine, you know, um, medical reasons. You know, for LSD was the great sort of grenade that was thrown into Western culture, and, <laughs> and um, people just didn't just didn't know what to do with it. Like, geez, what is this? You know, and there were not medical tests on it, so you know, you wouldn't. 
a doc, you can't take you know any chemical now it has to be regulated made sure it's safe and so on so i think there was a, there was a genuine concern as well although after that the science seems to be was exaggerated so you had all these adverts about how a uh, pregnant woman's fetus was sort of a uh, you know um degraded when she if she was taking lsd which is false and there was all all this propaganda about it frying a brain and so on whilst at the same time alcohol and tobacco was allowed you know so it was very inconsistent the laws um so, yeah so that's just uh, they're, they're just a few reasons and all on top of that there was this reductive um point of view in academia in psychology philosophy and so on that consciousness was an illusion anyway and it was of no value academic value so all of these factors combined so it sort of in a way lsd came out at precisely the wrong time you know for it to be really valued or understood or or you could say it came out at precisely the right time to sort of throw a grenade into all of this kind of reductivism but anyway that happened i mean something that could have happened that didn't in the 50s was aldous huxley humphrey osmond who coined the word psychedelic um they they were planning this amazing uh, gathering called outsight they were going to get 50 of the top leading intellectuals including einstein and jung to Cass, Graham Greene, others, to all take mescaline and, and at a sort of conference and, and write about it. But they didn't get the funding in the end. Mm. And Osmond actually blamed the re stuffy reductivism of the Ford Foundation, people on the board of the Ford Foundation for that. So it could have taken, psychedelic like could have taken a very different turn if that had been funded, I think. Mm. But as a, but but you know, in the 20th century then, it was quite an intellectual um, pursual, an artistic pursual, and then it became known as a recreative criminal um, um, thing to do. And I think now with the psychedelic renaissance the last 10 years or so, it's sort of coming back into the medical field, at least. Mm -hmm. yeah. may, may I have yeah, sure. a question? Uh, did I understood correctly that you are teaching uh, philosophy right now in, in London uni University? Uh, no? Exeter, Exeter University, yeah. Okay. Uh, but my question is that... Uh, what is, by your mind, the biggest, the biggest difference uh, from from those times when you yourself studied uh -huh. at university? Any yeah, um, any changes? Uh, yeah. How philosophy yeah. thought? Yeah. Um, there have been there have been quite a few changes uh, in you mean generally or in relation yeah. to psychedelics or both generally. Um, well, twenty years ago. I mean, I did my master's, I graduated 2003 with my master's degree, you know, and um, that was Warwick University, but it was quite more aggressive philosophy at that time. So it's, uh, you know, a lot of um, debates, which became quite violent. Mm -hmm. And at the, at the end, there, everyone shook their hands like a boxing match, you know, you, you shake your hands. <laughs> but, but, but it was seen, yeah, and it was, I mean, it was, Wittgenstein was still very influential, I should say, generally speaking, well respected. And um, very male dominated then, still is partially now. And then, um, and then the last sort of twenty years, it's softened a bit. So there's less, there's less aggression. When someone gives a talk to a conference, you always thank them, even if you didn't like the talk, you know. And um, and um, there's more tolerance. Some people don't like this. They like the sort of competitive feel mm -hmm. that you sort of weed away bad ideas quickly. Um, others prefer the toleration. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, on top of that, the actual content has changed. So you have the metaphysical turn that's progressed, especially in analytic philosophy. Um, there's interest in different forms of the mind now. So the 4E um, cognition, so like extended mind, an active mind, a body mind, so on, which means that um, there's a move away from thinking that the brain alone is necessary and sufficient for consciousness. So they people believe that actually it's not just the brain, it's the whole body, embodied consciousness as well, and the environment even more so. You know, you cut away the environment, you cut off part of consciousness. And um, and so there's a move away from what is known as neuroessentialism. Mm -hmm. so, um which is quite, you know, so so again that opens up a lot of new avenues of thought, you know, especially in relation to psychedelics, especially in relation to a nature connectedness that psychedelics can induce, you know. Yeah. So, so there's a connection between the brain body and the natural environment that you wouldn't really talk about 20 years ago. Yeah. yeah well, there's a nature connectedness um, takes us, uh, gets us uh, closer to to Spinoza, which uh, you said is um, would be would be our favorite topic. Uh, 
today. But before we get into there, oh, I very much like the, the the title of the second paper. The the uh, and I think I'll I'll I titled the interview with the say in Estonian, the white son of substance. Mm. <laughs> so the substance. What's I mean, that's the key issue really there, isn't it? What I mean, what is the substance in that uh, before we divulge into, uh, into spin? Um, <laughs> well, the, the reason for that title on my chapter on Spinoza and psychedelic experiences that um, comes from uh, Roland, again, this poet. Um, and it means this flash of insight uh, that is that you are, you know, you're not isolated, you are part of nature, you know, this is sort of, it's a feeling a bit like people can suddenly have this feeling of death, you know, you can think that you're going to die, but to really feel it is a horrific emotion I've experienced a few times. <laughs> but this, this, this flash of Spinozism, the white son of substance is, um, is akin to that in that is an intuition of your connectedness to the whole universe um, that, you know, has been documented over time, for thousands of years and many cultures but it also relates to the fact that i do speak about this particular psychedelic called 5-meo dmt which is a very powerful psychedelic um that really immediate you you can smoke and immediately um you see a white light like a white sun you know and it's a substance and then you sort of lose all forms of of mind except for a sense of profundity and also for other reasons you know so substance in spinoza means the same as god and it means the same as nature so um i thought that was an appropriate title for that chapter um, but it really yeah it just evokes this notion of um god being nature um, and you being part of that right mm -hmm. uh, I, I wasn't I, I was a bit puzzled i understand that spinoza uh, no problem with that that the spinoza is a monist as a as a, as opposed to the De, uh, who is a dualist but uh, what do you mean by neutral there in in, in front of the uh, yeah that, that's a word i was a bit puzzled with uh, neutral monism the reason for it is you can you can get material monism which is basically materialism there's one substance and that is matter mm -hmm. you can get ideal monism which is idealism one substance that's mind but for Spinoza and other thinkers like Whitehead, there's not the fundamental substance is neither mind nor matter. It's beyond that. So it's it includes both, but but it's more. So for Spinoza, um, his ultimate one substance is God or nature. Um, and that uh, for us humans um is expressed as mind and also is expressed as matter, but they're just two expressions of the same one thing. And that's that's the reason for the prefix neutral. So it's um, in both, but more. Uh, um, you said that you, you wrote your uh, doctoral thesis on panpsychism, ban right? Yeah. And uh, and uh, Spinoza also leads. Uh, there a strong connection with Spinoza there. Could you say elaborate on 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 that uh, connection? Yeah. Okay. Well, so. Uh, hmm, I, I, so I go back to Descartes. So Spinoza, in a way, was a response to Descartes' dualism. So Descartes had this dualism that mind and matter were totally separate substances, which in humans alone interacted in the brain. But he can never explain this interaction, and this is why it's a bit problem. It's, it's generally not believed. N not many philosophers accept it anymore. Um, so, so instead, Spinoza then said that mind and matter are, like I said, two expressions of the same thing, just like. And the morning star and the evening star are both expressions of Venus. And um, but what that means is that it's not just all of matter and all of mind are both expressions of the same thing. That means that all of matter has a mental element to it, not just the brain, um, but every constituent part of nature. So, um, you know, so, of course, humans and mammals, but fish, insects, plants, even bacteria all the way down but you have to be careful with panpsychism generally to differentiate aggregates from units so um you know you wouldn't think for example this cup has its own point of view because it's not um a systematic unit whereas a plant would be for example um so that that's generally panpsychism and spinoza provides an early version of panpsychism really yeah. but i mean pans the belief that plants had sentience was you find in plato and aristotle and all most of the greeks you know yeah. Um, so there's nothing really new and all the great many of the great 
philosophers were panpsychists of one variety or another. Leibniz was, you know, Fechner, Hegel to an extent. Um, William James was in the end, you know, in his book, Pluralistic Universe even, and um, Bergson to a certain extent. Whitehead especially. Whitehead's the greatest modern um, pan panpsychist philosopher, really. Well, yeah, that was a very interesting. Uh, I'm glad you brought uh, Whitehead up. You uh, one sentence that fascinated me is that when you perceive, uh, if I remember correctly, now, when when you perceive Whitehead said, when you perceive something that becomes part of you, was it? Yes, that's right. That's his theory of apprehension. Yeah, apprehension. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so it's well, hmm. that's a very interesting kind of. Um, yeah, so he thinks Western thought generally. So Whitehead was, you know, died in 1947. He was a mathematician at Cambridge, then moved to London as a philosopher of science and moved to Harvard as a metaphysician. Um, but he's got this really, I think the, the greatest gift Whitehead gives us is this theory of prehension, which is a new for theory of perception, really. So mm -hmm. we generally, he says, you know, from David Hume and others, we think there's five senses, you know, vision, hearing, smell, taste, touch. But, um, but, um, yeah, Whitehead offers this new theory where um, it's not like um, data comes to our eyes and then goes to our brain and then magically there emerges a picture of something, you know, it's called representa representationalism, you know, we represent what's outside, a bit like Kant, you know, so he's arguing against Kant in this way, mm. you know, the phenomena as opposed to the noumena. Rather, there's a continuous lineage of sentience outside, so he's a panpsychist, a panexperientialist, that continues, so like when I look at the sun, for example, um, the light um, of the sun, which has a feeling in itself, it's not just my inference, there's a feeling in the sun itself, the sunlight, that hits me and becomes interfused with my perception. And so part of the sun becomes part of me. And that is um, this, this primal perception that all things have. It's not consciousness. So it's mostly subconscious. So, um, you know, when you have feelings in, in the weather, you know, these are not inferences based on, these are not inferences, these are real absorption of emotions from the environment, emotional contagion, you could say almost, you know. This is also in Bergson, in his theory of sympathy, part of intuition, and that inspired Whitehead a bit, I believe, but um, Whitehead made it very systematic, and uh, it explains, it's very, I mean, I can't explain it in a few minutes here very well, but um, it explains a lot of problems in philosophy. So, so, for example, the problem of causation, David Hume said, we can never perceive actual causes, just perceive constant conjunctions of do things, and then we infer a cause. But for Whitehead, you do actually perceive a cause. That, looking at the sunlight, is the cause itself moving into you. So perception is causation. Perception. It is direct memory as well. You, you immediately, the past moment flows into the present moment transition of emotion wow. so it's a it's a beautiful concept and i haven't done it justice now <laughs> but um it's it's i'm actually writing an article about it um for a magazine so um, i'm going to try and make it more intelligible to people mm -hmm. but it's yeah but it's um but well, it's a realism so i mean you know whitehead's book which i happen to have here is called process and reality mm -hmm. that title it's from 1929 that title was based on F.H. Bradley's book, Appearance and Reality, and F.H. Bradley was an idealist. Uh -huh. So he thought this, there was a distinction between that phenomena and noumena. Um, Whitehead was a realist, so he thought that that distinction is really false, you know, that they are interfused. You really do perceive reality directly. Although, of course, humans perceive it one way, another animal will perceive it another way, and so on. But nonetheless, what we do perceive is part of reality. It's not a representation of reality. Mm. Mm. And that again it induces a sense of nature connectedness, you know, right. away from alienation. So that's why I think it's useful in understanding certain psychedelic uh, experiences of nature connectedness. It's just sort of again a metaphysical framework. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for me, uh, that was very interesting. That substance is both code and nature, and mm -hmm. as we, uh, at least, uh, we have been grown up during Soviet Union, Union <laughs> times. It means that electrical materialism. Uh, yeah, and and this driven uh, philosophy was uh, atheism, yeah. and at least two generations here have, have grown up uh, under this main philosophy of atheism. So, but this definition of substance uh, definition that the substance is code and nature, by my mind, helps a lot of uh, young generation to 
we are talking a lot about paradigm uh, change yeah. and and this helps because if it's only relig uh, religion uh, mm -hmm. then religion has usually traditional roots yeah. <laughs> or yeah. some for some people this um, mystical experience but it's not uh, it's not so that okay if you grow up uh, under atheistic philosophy you just say that now today i'm from from the today's yeah, it's a bit like, of a stretch right? <laughs> yeah, bit of stretch yeah. but 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 this um, pante pantheism and and this definition of substance that god and nature both mm -hmm. are substance it, it kind of fruit. makes it easier to, yeah. to swallow yeah. Yeah. well actually yeah no, and, and a lot of people i um ask me to to give a lecture on spinozism for that reason you know it's a form of it, it's not anti-scientific i mean einstein's favorite philosopher was spinoza you know even wrote two love poems to spinoza about it. <laughs> and he's the greatest philosopher of the modern time mm -hmm. einstein said of spinoza so it's not anti-scientific and um you know, if you say that God is nature, I mean, it's very hard not to believe in God because it's like not therefore believing in nature, right? <laughs> and um, <laughs> but, but Spinoza's God is not like the religious gods at all. I mean, he's he's not a judge or a person or or, or well, well, that's a whole new discussion. But um, I mean, I think Spinoza's view is really parsimonious. It really um, solves Descartes' dualism problems, mm -hmm. and the reason that it didn't become scientific um doctrine in a way or framework is because it was spinoza himself was he was excommunicated by his fellow jews mm -hmm. he died 1677 um his books were banned by the church for 100 years and um it's partly because of his pantheism but also because he was he he argued that the first five books in the of the bible were not written by one man moses they were written by various authors you know mm -hmm. so he was ahead of his time there Anyway, it was seen as very evil to be a follower of Spinoza in the uh, 17th, 18th centuries, mm -hmm. until in 17, the late 1700s, in the 1780s, 90s, there was this pantheism controversy in Germany, and a lot of philosophers um, got involved, Lessing, uh, Mendelssohn, um, Goethe eventually, and others, and uh, they, and suddenly interest in, in Spinoza became um, pretty, you know, sort of burst, really, and that led to you know, Kant's philosophy to a certain extent, Hegel's philosophy, which then led to Marx, which led to your dialectical materialism, of course, unfortunately, in the uh, Baltic states and beyond. But, um, but, but the scientific endeavor had moved on already. So, in a way, science, science, as we understand it today, is based on dualism. Even though it got rid of the soul, it still accepts the other side, which is matter as purely dead, mm -hmm. without any value within it itself without any sentience, without any divinity. You know? So 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 materialism is not really a scientific um doctrine, but it's the basis of Western science. It's a me is the metaphysics underlying Western science, um, which is subconscious. You know, scientists don't know about this. It's just assumed, especially in biology, maybe not so much in physics anymore, with quantum physics, but certainly in, in biology. biology yeah. yeah. And um, you know, so <clears throat> so then you get all these questions about you know how does the brain create the mind you know these are kind of in a way not quite genuine questions when you look at the history you realize why they why they have become problems and um i think that you could have a really more interesting science with a with a monist foundation neutral monist foundation rather than the materialist one Marx, of course, you know, Estonia, I mean, this is quite tragic what happened. And also, I think, I mean, from my point of view, I, I, I've never been to Estonia. I went to Lithuania once and I saw some of the KGB prisons then. Yeah. But um, I think as well, it, this kind of dialectic materialism, it just makes you not, it just alienates humans from nature. You know, you just see it as a sort of you know, space extension ge geometry, you know, without any real value. The only value exists for the the people, humans, and thus you can exploit it. And this probably led to the industrial, you know, like um, ecological crisis to a certain extent as well. So anyway, I think there's a great need uh, for this metaphysical shift in culture and Western culture now. Which which psychedelics can help then? I... Yeah, I think I think they can. Yeah, I mean, not only psychedelics, but 
they are you know a catalyst i mean there's this interesting empirical study from imperial college a couple of years ago which showed that people who take psychedelics on the whole shift their metaphysics from physicalism materialism to panpsychism you know it's an interesting one they do but the problem is of course you know when you ask them why they nobody can explain it and that's why again i think it's it would be useful to have a metaphysical um aspect to therapy to sort of say that listen what you experience there is not necessarily false mm -hmm. you know there might be some truth in it mm -hmm. when you think it's false when you fall back to normal culture and and then you think oh, okay that that must have been rubbish you know it couldn't possibly be true but then you have to realize that we are all living in a metaphysical culture, you know, and the most powerful metaphysics are the ones that are hidden, that we're not, we are not cognizant of, you know, this is how ideology works. Exactly. Yeah. yeah so but, psychedelics could be a way of breaking us out a little bit. Yeah. As you said, hallucination is uh, something that is a relational concept uh, to reality. And if you don't, once you assume that, once you recognize that there are many possible realities, that's a kind of... Um, Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, um, that's why there's this there's this thing called the comforting delusion objection that Michael Pollan and Chris Leatherby talk about, which is that, um, you know, it's unethical to treat people with psychedelics because you foster a delusion on them, which makes them better. But of mm -hmm. course, you can, yeah, as you say, you can only say it's a delusion if you already know what reality is. Yeah, exactly. Because that's a really open question. Yeah. And one of the things that keeps that question open more than anything else is the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. why the matter related. Nobody agrees on an answer to that. And when that question is still open, we have to be open to all the metaphysical possibilities. Right. Yeah. Well, um, animism and panpsychism. Ban uh, how do you? How, how do you? What? But uh, panpsychism is more is a more secular secular under, undertones, right? Or... Gen generally speaking, yeah. So I mean, they are related. The two sides of the same. I always say animism is a religious side, um, panpsychism is a secular side. But essentially, they both agree that you know there are um, sentiences in nature. I say sentience, not consciousness, because consciousness often means conscious. You know, you're aware of something. But um, sentiences can be just like a subconscious feeling. Just to help. Um, Help me with the translation. What would be the synonyms for sentient? Well, <laughs> you know, the interesting thing about translating. Hello? No word for mind. Mm -hmm. um, but sentience, um, I would say, like, generally it's mind or um, experience. Mm -hmm. You know, in English, we've got this word conscious. Are you conscious of the fact that the window's open? It means you are aware of it, right? So when you turn that adjective conscious into a noun, consciousness, it mm -hmm. often connotes awareness. Mm -hmm. So sentience is not necessarily awareness. It includes awareness as an umbrella term. It's a general term that includes the conscious and the subconscious. So I don't know what, you know, what, what is there a so Estonian word for that? I don't know. No, that's for me, but let's just get uh, more uh, for more of a, more of a touch. Yeah. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a word that includes subconscious, conscious, experience, every form of mentality. Another English word is mentality, you could say. Yeah, yeah mentality is a good one, too. Yeah. It's, but it's important because for panpsychists, they don't think everything's conscious, you know. They think everything's sent. Every unit, not aggregate, is sent. Yeah. It's quite an important distinction. Um, what was the question? I forgot where I was. I, I don't think there was. I think. Uh... No, there was. What was there? What? Yeah, but. I also well, let's take let's take a new one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, I think <laughs> ecological thing. I, I very much uh, you know, like this apart from your uh, article on uh, on um, Spinoza. Hans Jonas argues that we require new ethics to co uh, to counter our ecological issues, mm -hmm. one that must now factor nature as vulnerability and prime value. This cannot be achieved, I, I think this is a crucial part, this cannot be achieved, he writes, without restoring the category of the sacred, mm -hmm. the category most destroyed by, science, by the scientific enlightenment. Yeah. And it's just, uh, the prima facie paradoxical restora restoration of the sacred cannot be achieved by religion, which is exactly our uh, point earlier, which is anthropocentric and dead to us. I mean, you... In a sense, we we already touched that uh, when you asked, uh, answered Kaya's question, but uh, it's so the relation depth psychology, ecological thinking, panpsychism, uh, animism was kind of it's one. all related, and that's the other question: animism, panpsychism, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, but I'll come back. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting thing with uh, Hans Jonas. Um, so yeah, you need a notion of the divine which can't be religious. Well, I think Spinoza provides that, and. 
<laughs> and um, Arne Ness, the Norwegian yeah. philosopher yeah. who, who um, found a deep, deep ecology, he was he wrote a, um, an essay, Spinoza and Ecology. He, he, th he said Spinoza oh. Whitehead. Spinoza Whitehead and Heidegger, I think he said, were the three sort of main thinkers that could uphold the metaphysical framework of deep ecology, Spinoza especially. Um, why? Yeah, but well, because nature is God and all of nature is alive. Um, Hans Jonas' point is quite interesting. When you look at ethical theories of the past, like from Kant and Bentham and Mill and so on, they never factor in nature as a variable. That's always like a safe background thing you don't have to consider. You consider other humans, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, now that nature's being uh, harmed, it's very important for our survival alone, you know, to sort of factor that into an ethics. And how do you do, you need to therefore reevaluate um, um, sort of uh, approach to nature? And that's what Spinoza can do, I think, in a non-religious manner, in a manner that is not anti-scientific. It's not not the slightest anti-scientific, and. Um, and it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, I think, very like, inspiring for people. But I would just add that Spinoza is a good start. But I think, again, Whitehead takes it next step with his theory of prehensions. You know, there's real interconnectedness. You get in Whitehead, you don't get in Spinoza so much. But Whitehead was influenced by Spinoza and others. So there's oh, a lineage there. There's, it's basically, it's a, it, there's, a, there's an underground stream in Western philosophy and Western thought that never really emerged into the, the mainstream picture of things. But which is actually, I think, much more um, useful and uh, might 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 emerge soon. But we'll see. You will see, but, like Bergson, Spinoza, uh, Whitehead. Who would you? I think Whitehead provides the most systematic and the most sort of beautiful new thought, um, which is important for the ecological age. And interestingly, in America. The organization that continued Whitehead's thought when he was suppressed in Europe, the Center for Process Studies, they are now <coughs> focusing on ecological civilization using his thought. But the problem with Whitehead is he's very difficult to understand. You know, it's very in I've I've tr I've given talks on Whitehead's, but it's it, you can't really convey his th philosophy very quickly. Spinoza, though, is relatively quick. So like God is nature, mind is matter. Mm -hmm. um, that's people can pick that up pretty quickly. So I think, you know, you start with Spinoza and he's like a gateway drug to Whitehead. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice one, yeah. And there's a lot of other, uh, we're approaching the end of the hour, but uh, uh, there is uh, another author that I hadn't uh, heard about, is Patrick Lundborg. And mm. uh, Pantheism is, is the psychedelic core value, which was kind of interesting. Uh, inter I mean, these... Who, who who was a Patrick Lundberg to Lundberg to, to, to um, stop? Patrick Langberg was like a cu cultural commentator. I mean, not a professional philosopher, but very much involved with philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, he was Swedish, Swedish guy, and uh, based in Stockholm. He was very much interested in psychedelic culture, music, imagery, and so on, and history as well. He wrote a book called Psychedelia, excellent book, about um, fifteen years ago. Or so published articles as well. But he, he died uh, about, I don't know, quite a few years ago now, five to ten years ago, and uh, he's not, not very well known at all. But, um, yeah, he said there are certain psychedelic core values, and pantheism was one, monism was another one. And these he, he claims that these are um, metaphysical positions that often strike people who have taken psychedelics. Um, not necessarily. I should always emphasize that there are there's a wide variety of religion, of, um, psychedelic experiences you know and uh, these metaphysical ones are only one but they are certainly quite common in the west the interesting question is if they're common elsewhere as well it seems that they might be common in india and asia generally with it, if you think about the vedas and the eastern philosophy that was used in the west in the 20th century but an another inter very interesting question is about the amerindians right because they're animist so there's that connection but um they also Psychedelics for them also invoke like ancestral spirits, which is not that common in the West, you know. So there's always the question as to how much does culture influence the experience? You know, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's language. Right. It's a big debate, big debate in uh, between like the perennialists who think that, um, like William James and Aldous Huxley think there's one core truth experience, the peak experience, which is the true, which is the truth and therefore true of all cultures. And then there's contextualists 
like Stephen Katz, who believe that you know, even the experience, not just the interpretation, but the experience itself is determined by the culture. So I'm in the middle. I think, you know, obviously your culture determines a bit and your life experience determines a little bit. But on a high enough dose, it seems you transcend culture. Yeah. I mean, these things with 5-MeO, there's nothing within my culture here in England or Sweden that <laughs> relates to that in the slightest, you know. So I can't I can't really see that argument. Yeah, well, but it's an interesting debate, ongoing debate. I haven't tried that one yet, but uh, mm. I can imagine that we can be... When, when was that? When was the... Uh, 5-MeO... Uh, 5-MeO. When, when did I do that? Um, oh, like it's about two or three years ago now, yeah once and i haven't really dared to take it again it's so so extreme i was still processing it yeah about that i took i took it for that paper i sent you on spinoza <laughs> really, really purely for academic reasons you know? <laughs> because it wasn't it wasn't pleasurable you know uh, it was not a recreational drug it's quite you know a severely intense thing they're actually developing 5-meo now for depression and um i'm i'm part of a part of that i I shouldn't, I'm not really allowed to talk about that much, but at the moment, but it's um, interesting developments are happening there. I remember Michael Pollan described his experience in the Joe Rogan show. That was quite. Uh, uh, I don't think I've seen that. I see. I, I think yeah. I'm I, I'm quite positive that well, that there was a five M over. Yeah, that's. Uh, I can send you the. Uh, I, okay. I, yeah. 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 Let's see that actually. <laughs> so, uh, so we're like a couple of minutes to go. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I have one conclusion already. <laughs> oh, oh. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as you mentioned that you haven't been in Estonia, that that um, uh, yeah, maybe one day if you decide to come over, yeah, but, yeah that's... we are really pleased to host you, and oh, yes, that... we can yeah. continue our conversation. How often do you uh, how often how often do you come to Sweden? Um, not very often, but I am coming to Sweden in August, actually, for the first time in six years. Um, I used I used to go there all the time, but my grandfather died about seven years ago, so that stopped me. But I've still got uh, my mum's cousin and my second cousin's in Malmö. So, uh, yeah, okay, it's a very kind offer. I would like to, I've always wanted to visit Estonia. So I uh, had a very good Estonian friend in London, actually, Gint, he was called. Yeah. So um, thank you for the offer. Yeah. And, uh, I will, um, I'll remember it. <laughs> so. yeah, very good. The very last question. Uh, I mean, this is uh, we have the topic, uh, central topic for each newspaper. This time it's uh, this time it's totalitarianism in, in in general. But what, so on front cover we'll have something on Orwell. When when did you least when did you last read Orwell and just any off the cuff remarks on Orwell and that's the well. <laughs> when did I last? Um, oh yeah, there's a uh, the last. Um, what was it called now? Um, politics. I think it's called Politics in the English Language. An essay by oh, him. That's a great. Yeah, that, yeah. That's a, like an essay, basically. Yeah, it's a short essay about how to write well in English. Yeah. It's very, yeah. extremely, extremely useful. And I, I often give it to my students to um, understand how to write good essays or parts of it. So, uh, what can I say about that? You know, um, probably the greatest essay on how to achieve English prose style. Yeah. Uh, still yeah i read that that's what i was also very much impressed by yeah any reminiscences rem, rem, what's the word reminiscence well, uh, any memories from uh, 1984 well, i read it many years ago um very powerful book of course i uh what can i say about that really as uh you know it seems to have some of it seems to have come true like um, people watching you from within your home, you know, advertising to you on the internet and so on, and listening to you, and and uh, but I I I, uh, I don't know. I, I try to stay a little bit outside of politics because um, you just <laughs> people immediately become angry, and then I just try to avoid this. You know, so. but I do I do admire Orwell as a writer. He's a brilliant writer, of course. Him, Old Huxley, also brilliant writers. Um, we have elections this week. Yeah, yeah well. Uh... Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. I don't know the situation in Estonia. Interestingly, what happened to Sweden, of course, has turned quite right wing, you know, with the government there for the first time in two hundred years or something. <laughs> Estonia, is it dangerous? Is it a danger there? Is there... Oh, I mean, it probably carries on the same as. Yeah, well, but, but some newcomers. Uh, we're not in politics here. We're not in politics either. Yeah, some newcomers, but yeah. 
generally the, the overall situation is is uh, uh, more strange than it was yeah it's getting few years ago. it's getting it's getting strange any uh, i guess i guess you must be worried about russia uh, yeah that's yeah. Uh, yeah, that's uh... this is one of the key topics uh, definitely <laughs> Uh, but yeah, well, um, as I said, we have the great books course, and I think I'll carry after William James, the Huxley's perennial philosophy seems to be like the logical. Uh, any any remarks? Just the very uh, very last question. Uh, um, perennial philosophy. Uh, perennial philosophy. Interesting when you look at the history of it, because a lot of people think it was coined by Leibniz, but it actually goes back to um, a guy called Augustino Stucco from the 16th yeah. century, who was a Roman Catholic counter reformationist. And um, he himself carried that on from something called, I think it was called the Universal Theology. So it goes back all the way really to Plotinus, someone I haven't mentioned in this hour, but is very influential in mysticism. It's in the second paper I sent you, you know. Oh, yeah, Plotinus, um, we had an interview with Tarnas on him, basically. Oh, did you? Okay, I do. All right. Okay, so, so um, yeah, the Neoplatonist, Plotinus. So it's an interesting lineage, really, from Plotinus all the way well from therefore plato all the way from to uh the, you know the present but the perennial philosophy then really relates to this 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 talk this debate between perennialism and contextualism and right. there's a really good paper which places the opposite side of you contextualism by stephen katz I, 19, I, 1978 is referenced i think in my paper there so if you haven't read that i really recommend that as a sort of alternative uh point of view all right well uh Hours lapsed and um, uh, yeah, well, that passed so quickly, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah. Thank you so much for your time again. And uh, uh, oh, well, um, I love talking about these things, so it's all good. <laughs>